Hi, everyone, and welcome to the SCTE ISB's 2020 L&D Experience. I'm Nancy Murphy with Cox Communications and your chair for this dynamic and highly relevant event. It's been an honor to lead this experience at Expo this year and to have a front row seat to the investments that SCTE is making to innovate the way we train cable professionals at every level. We are so excited to bring together learning experts from both in and outside the cable industry to discuss pandemic responses, training strategies for today's workforces, and what the future holds for L&D. So in a moment, I'll introduce our keynote speaker, but first I'd like to remind you to join us at two o'clock today, Eastern Standard Time, where you will have an opportunity to engage in a discussion where panelists will share insights on how learning has had to evolve during COVID-19 and other events. This immersive experience will include the ability for you to engage both in chat conversations with your fellow learners, as well as to ask questions of the panelists. And then at four o'clock Eastern time, you definitely don't wanna miss this. It's our L&D Experience Happy Connection Hour where we will have some interesting topics to discuss as well as some fun activities and even better prizes. So feel free to bring a beverage, a snack of your choice. This is no judgment. And then finally, tomorrow at Eastern Standard Time at two, um, you will not wanna miss a panel discussion of business executives from Comcast, Cox and Digicel where they will share how learning has impacted their companies, focusing on organizational change, had just a little bit of change this year, right? The impact of COVID-19 and what the future holds for learning from their perspective. So without further delay, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our keynote speaker, Anthony Lapia, who is a senior manager, global lead, strategic accounts and learning solutions with LinkedIn. Now, I would venture to guess we probably all know quite a bit about LinkedIn and probably on their network, right? The professional network. They are the world's largest professional network with over 700 million users in more than 200 countries and territories worldwide. LinkedIn is also very well known for their robust video courses taught by industry experts in software, creative and business skills. So we are fortunate to have Anthony. He is a lifelong learner with a passion for problem solving. He works with LinkedIn customers around the globe to enable them to anticipate and build the skills that will help them win in their respective markets. And I, I love his personal mantra, so I've just got to share it. It is stay humble, stay hungry, get better every day. So with that, Anthony, again, thank you so much for being with us and sharing your insights on learning. All right, everybody. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, officially, I will now be bringing you everywhere that I need to go. What, a, what an honor to be here and what a great intro. I am thrilled to be a part of the Cable Tech Expo this year and I know the group has been working really hard to put this conference together. And with all the challenges that have happened in the last year, one has to be very impressed with how well things are coming together. We have ventured into new territory, friends. We are at a virtual conference where many of you are business on top, potentially sweatpants on bottom. And that's okay. Like Nancy said, no judgment. So as was explained, my role with LinkedIn is, is there listed very lengthy, but let me tell you really who I am. I am the person who has benefited from 17 years of my career being able to witness, observe, and learn from the best in the market in human capital management. For the last number of years, it's been in recruiting and learning, but across the entire function, I have had the distinct pleasure of being able to be a learn it all, because I'll tell you ahead of this speech, I am not a know-it-all. In fact, I haven't come so much to educate you, but to stimulate the conversations that you'll have with one another while you're here and to spend a little time throwing around some of the things that are provoking the change that's happening in our marketplace. 
So let's talk about our time today. I'm going to start with a story. Why? Because no one wants to sit here and listen to me just spout off stats uh, or anecdotes. They want to hear something real. So I'll start with a story about us. It's not my story. It's ours. Then we'll dive into a little bit about the modern learner and how much they need us right now. And I'll walk you through some of the things that I've observed with learning organizations that are nailing it and what characteristics they share. I'll flash up some of the fastest growing and biggest in-demand skills in your own industry. And maybe we'll end with a question of how are we doing so that that can spark conversations amongst you and your peers as you spend the rest of the time at the conference. So without further ado, let me begin with this story that I've been preparing for you. It's not unique. My year started like it always does. In fact, multiple times a year, we get to putting our thoughts on pen and paper, understanding our business priorities, the things that our particular function need to accomplish and the ways that will enable our team to not only meet their goals, but exceed their goals and expectations for the year by really being able to support them in an ecosystem that can thrive. My guess is that you had a plan too. And like any year can throw a bunch of things at you, 2020 has most certainly been unique in that it's thrown about as much as a, at us as we can take. I felt really proud because my business plan felt aligned to the things that my organization needed to accomplish. I felt as though for my team, we had identified and really understood the critical targets and activities and we had lined up our resources for success. And then overnight, the world changed. For me, it was March 13th, 2020. For any of you parents out there, you may have gotten this phone call as well. Uh, my wife, Caitlin, and I share seven children in our blended family three sixth graders, three fourth graders, and one superstar first grader. And when the phone rang on March 13th, we got the automated message that schools would be closed for the next two weeks. And as two people who feel like we can take on anything, we looked at each other and thought, we're completely screwed. This is not gonna go very well. Little did we know with a global pandemic developing, social unrest that would follow, natural disasters, a challenged economy, and an election year, that things would get more interesting both in our lives and in our business. But I tell you this story because many of us can relate to before we could figure out what was going on in the workplace, we had to nail what was going on at home. Our kids are probably the best example of progressive learners that we can think of. And as the economy moves towards digital learning and digital skills being the predominant need in the marketplace, no one is being better equipped in trial by fire than our kids. They're taking on class from a distance. They're turning in assignments. They're Zoom calling and WebExing and any other that you can think of. And they're connecting in ways that before had never really been thought of for children of that age. And here we are. Our learners as an organization, now I'm not a practitioner, but we are a culture of learning. So as a leader in my organization, I am completely aligned to the learning leaders and completely responsible for helping them execute upon their vision with their end target, which is our employees. And our learners have never needed us more. But the truth is, people in general have never needed us more. If you think about the professional context, this is Fouad, who's a member of my organization. Now, not about Fouad specifically, but he represents a high achiever in my organization who we sit down at the beginning of the year and we think about the skills gaps that we have, the skills surpluses that we have, and what we're going to prioritize first to ensure that we can win in our market. For us, it's supporting and delighting customers and helping them deliver learning to their own organizations. 
So what do we need to build fluency in? What are the things that we are not necessarily executing well with that must change? Well, a year ago, if we talked about Fouad and his peers, it would be that we wanted to enhance the way that they behaved as strategic thinkers. We wanted to improve the way that they would hold court with executives and communicate initiatives. And we wanted to streamline the way that they would prioritize and plan to get their job done so that they could better support our customers, spend more face time with them, do the things that help them win. After March 13th, and now we still sit very much in the throes of a global pandemic, pending recession, and any number of other things, my first call of business these days is to call and check how he's doing or anybody on my team, how are they doing? Health and well-being has not only become a constant conversation between coach and mentee or manager and employee, but it's also become a big part of our learning track, enabling our folks to better take care of themselves, both mentally and physically. And then comes the change for folks that are either in a completely remote working position and those who are in a hybrid position. What does that look like? Productivity. I don't know about you, but it's challenging. Not only because of all the things that are happening in the home, but also just the isolation of not being able to sit and talk with a coworker. I miss that. Of course, we still have a focus on job related skills and we still enable our folks, but for certain, the prioritization, prioritization chain has changed. And to put things on a lighter note, I really miss even just getting dressed up for work. Today, being on the virtual conference, it's nice not to be in a hooded sweatshirt for a change and that elastic waist that I referenced before. And many of you may be missing that as well. I wanna talk about a few insights that we've seen through LinkedIn data that have signaled the shift that is happening not only to what's going on in the acute sense of what's happening with the global pandemic and the pending recession, but also before that, some of the changes in the market and the changes in the ways that organizations are behaving that are signaling a very important shift. Executive engagement between October and June of this past year and executive engaging, engagement meaning organizations that have C-level execs sitting in and taking an active role in planning for learning strategy jumped from 27 to 70%. Cool data point, what does it really mean? It means that learning has taken a absolute front seat position in the prioritization chain for C-levels. Maybe it took a global pandemic, but this is a flashpoint for us as an industry and the moment that many of the learning leaders have been waiting for to have a seat at that table and help the C-level executives understand that a culture of learning can only happen if everyone is committed. Another research study that we conducted found that 56% of L&D pros doing business with LinkedIn Learning felt that their culture of learning was stronger now than before coronavirus. Necessity is the mother of invention. Organizations have become nimble, tribal knowledge within their organization has become lightning fast. And you think about the ways that learners are reaching beyond the commercial enterprise. Social learning on LinkedIn.com is on the rise by 600% over the last 90 days. And that's signaled by learners joining groups to be able to exchange information and knowledge with peers that they are yearning for, that they may not be getting through the, the corporate enterprise in the ways that they are given learning opportunities at work. And finally, Microsoft estimates that the global workforce could absorb 149 million new technology related jobs over the next five years. Software development is the biggest part of that, but there are other related technology jobs 
that will also signal a lot of that growth. I pause for a moment because what does that really mean? What it means is that with the need to reskill, long-term supply and demand is threatened. And we really have to prepare our folks in the organization to take on new responsibilities in new ways to be able to win in our respective markets and emerge stronger from any challenging times or come out stronger from times that are also very strong themselves. Some organizations are thriving during this that we work with. So a couple of things that I wanna dive into that we see organizations that are thriving or that have positioned themselves to thrive after all of this doing. And these behaviors really existed long before any of the events of the last year took place. If we are here to imagine the possibilities, I invite you to take this information and expand upon it in the conversations that you have with your peers, in the conversations that you have with your teams after this. But let's talk about two specific things. Leading through change and preparing for the future are two things that I see organizational leaders doing incredibly well. So what does that mean? Employee engagement is probably the most important thing to lead through change. Using LinkedIn as an, as an example, I'm so proud of the ways that we have communicated the changes in our organization to both support our employees and support our customers. It's created policy change. It's created a need for new knowledge around process and procedures. It's created, in some cases, the need to understand what's happening on an industry basis. And we've been pretty nimble with it. The biggest thing is learning is constant and employee engagement is constant with those programs that are sent down the pike. Wellness has been a huge focus. Why? Because folks that don't feel well can certainly not always perform well. And by putting the employee first and putting the learner first, trust and communication has been the most important thing that we've established with our employees to ensure that we can be agile as a workforce. Preparing for the future. So here's one that I'll spend a few minutes on and elaborate because it's really important to me having worked on both the talent acquisition side of the business and the learning side of the business. We talk a lot about employer brand. If you think about employer brand in the ways that it's received from the candidates in the marketplace and from your own employees, it's about a promise that you make and a promise that you keep. When you're recruiting new candidates in the marketplace, you are essentially telling them with your story, we are a great place to work. We will make long-term investments in you and you will thrive at this organization. Fast forward to somebody taking you at your word and coming and joining your organization. Learning and the learning organization becomes the vehicle for delivery of that promise. Will you upskill those folks? Will you create opportunity for them? And how often and consistently will you do it at multiple levels? That's employer brand. And when you think about how you find out how you've done, I look to our acquisition of the Glint product two years ago as one of the most important things that we've not only acquired to enable our customer, but we use it in an addictive way ourselves. Through the course of the last 10 months, we have surveyed our employees radically more than we had prior. We had always been pretty active with every three month surveys, but we've been using it now to understand what does our organization need? What is the best method for delivery? And what's the return on being able to do it quickly and effectively? So employer brand, I believe is the best way to prepare for the future and the partnership between talent acquisition and learning is critical. Building the future of skills. So understanding, and this encapsulates the next bullet point as well, understanding what your talent inventory looks like so that you can 
better prepare for the build or buy conversation as an organization. If you have core skills to build upon, then learning potentially could be the best way for you to go about upskilling your organization. But having a great communication loop with TA allows you to potentially go and find skills in marketplace where they may not exist in your organization. And that is really a key way for you to be able to emerge from the crisis stronger than you entered it. These aren't all the ways, obviously, for organizations to thrive, but these are two that I've observed that the best are doing, doing consistently and doing effectively. So let's dive a little bit more into if those are the two things that organizations are preparing for, what are some of the activities and behaviors that allow them to be most prepared? Collaboration, a buzz phrase that's thrown around all the time. In fact, many organizations more than likely consider themselves highly collaborative. I know that we do, but are we always collaborative? Do we always do it effectively? I don't know that we've always done it as effectively as we'd like. Here's what collaboration looks like in the organizations that I see winning on the learning and development front. Deep understanding and commitment with the lines of business. We mentioned it before that a learning and development organization can most certainly create amazing programmatic content. They can market that content well. They can create the best mousetrap for being able to uh, deploy it to field. But if there's not commitment in the line of business from leadership down, often what you find is disengagement. We've talked a bit about strong alignment with talent acquisition, but I put it out there again because I believe the builder by conversation makes talent acquisition your most important partner. The last piece is executive engagement and sponsorship across collaboration. What does that mean though? I think what that means for us, both what I've observed with organizations that my team supports and as well as the one that I'm working with is that are your leaders learners? Do they have commitment? Do they have pull through? And can they deeply articulate the why behind everything that you are doing? HR has long believed that people are the number one asset of any organization. When you have an organization that the leadership team are learners, can articulate the why, that means they believe it too. Insights for our organization and for the ones that we support seem to be the most important thing that we can bring to the table for them to support them. And it's the thing that they are often circled around the table discussing themselves. Data, having the right data, and then being able to align the decisions that you make to the objectives of the organization clearly is a skill. And the organizations that we see winning have it, not because of talent or knowledge, but because of intellectual curiosity open discussions where the dissenting opinion is invited. And through those insights, they develop an understanding of their organization and all of the people assets that make it up. And they have a deep understanding of what they have and don't have. And they're honest with themselves. Casting far out into the future so that they can make the best decisions to allow themselves to be in a strong competitive position. The last piece that I'll talk about here is action orientation. This goes back to what I talked about with our frequent surveys of our employees. Our programmatic learning at the beginning of the year would look very different than what it looks like today based on being agile in the happenings of today and being very connected to our employees. We have shifted gears and we have made decisions that allow us to know that our employees by and large are still very engaged in their jobs because they feel cared for, they feel supported and they feel connected to the organization. We all know that a disengaged employee can potentially be a very unproductive 
negative employee and not negative because they're negative, but negative because their experience is negative, which creates attrition. Can't have it in key roles. So we've got to take care of our people. We've used our action orientation. And in this case, I'm certainly using LinkedIn as an example. We've used our pulse surveys to take action and deliver bite-sized programs that deliver the on-demand learning that our people need. Is it around health and wellness? Is it around meditation? Is it around work from home? With social unrest, is it around inclusive leadership or diversity and inclusion and belonging in whole? Whatever it is, we've been very mindful about delivering the right content to allow our folks to feel like they're getting what they need when they need it. Let's take a quick look at your own industry and what the most in-demand skills are that are needed in the marketplace. And then I want you to take a few moments and ask yourself, how are we doing? Not to grade yourself on a scale of well to poor, but just where are we in the journey of building the foundational skills, competencies and capabilities that will allow us to be a successful company today and a successful company months, years, decades from now. Because ultimately your investment in people is the most important thing that you will do. Learning is a culture and culture each strategy every single time. It's definitely as or more important than anything that you'll do. I've seen firsthand at LinkedIn, because we have folks who by and large believe in the mission and believe in our vision and understand the pillars of our culture and values, they feel supported. They find meaning in their work and they know that their organization cares for them. And I think that's ultimately been a winning strategy for us, even more so than the ways that we execute within the business sometimes. So let's look at your industry. Here's the top 15 fastest growing and most in-demand skills. We can share the presentation. So if you're trying to jot this down really quick, don't feel like you've got to do them all. But how are you doing? Do you have them? Are you building them? Are you aware of them? Those are the three questions that I would typically ask myself, even when I look at my own team. What do we have? What do we need? What are we working on? So I promise to entertain you a little bit. I don't know if I have. I promise to be slightly informative knowing that I'm a learn it all, not a know it all. And I hope I've done that. And if I may take a moment, I wanna just retrace our steps. We talked in the beginning of this presentation about all of the things that you as L&D leaders, as people, as parents, as siblings, as friends, whatever. You've encountered a ton. And you've hopefully given yourself the permission to be able to take it all in and have some days to take care of you first. And yet you're still getting an amazing job done within your organization, a critical job. You're caring for the people that care for your customers. You're helping the people that help your customers develop the skills that they need to be able to serve them in any capacity that you are doing business in. And I wanna remind you, it's been a challenging, challenging year that isn't over yet, but in many ways, it's been a magical year. I feel like I've reached deep inside of myself and I feel like my team has reached deep inside of themselves to find capabilities they did not know they had both for coping and for executing. And it reminds me of one of my favorite quotes, I'm a huge boxing fan. And Muhammad Ali once said, it isn't the mountains ahead that you climb that wear you out. It's the pebble in your shoe. It's the little stuff. You'll amaze yourself otherwise against the big things and you probably have. So if you can, and since we're all from the comfort of our own Zoom, take a moment and give yourself a pat on the back for the job that you've done. Whether you believe you can do better or whether you've exceeded your own expectations, you've certainly faced the mountains. 
thank you for your time. And I look forward to answering any questions that you may have in follow up. Hi, Anthony. How you doing? Thank you for that awesome, awesome, awesome uh, insight into what's going on across the industry, as well as just in general, the top skills that are out there and the top skills that are needed. Um, before I get to you all, if you have questions for Anthony, please type it in the Q&A section, and then we will pull them over and feed them into Anthony. So Anthony, question for you. Just overall, if organizations are looking to, they looked at that list that you had, that you presented to us, and they see that here are some of the top skills or the top areas that individuals should be looking at. Um, and they know they want to get to that point, but they're not there. What should they do to try to move themselves into those areas where those are the top skills or the top industries that are happening in, for the future and for today? I, I believe the thing that, that always starts that exercise is the internal conversations that teams have amongst one another. So I mentioned a, a few different areas where when I see our customers clicking on all cylinders, like meaning that they're agile, they can get things done and they seem to be succeeding in hitting all of their learning initiatives, driving a, a big engagement, there's a few things that are present. Number one, it's open conversation with the right uh, players involved. So that's the lines of business leaders across all of your functions. That's the executives that are driving the change in the organization. And that's also some of your money ballers or champions within the organization that are just amazing at their jobs, but also amazing at being learners. Um, they can give you great feedback on how you're programs are landing on how your content is landing. And I, I think that winning organizations tend to have tons of open discussion, all of the right players involved, and they're using data to make decisions instead of opinions. Awesome. All right. Our next question comes, you mentioned surveys to employees. How do you manage the survey fatigue with the amount of surveys we send, to, send out to our employees, our learners? I don't know if we're doing a great job of it right now, to be honest. So we have probably erred on the side of over-communication. Reason being for us, which I can speak to, is because our culture, not on my team specifically, I've got a lot of remote workers that are remote by career, uh, and they've been in, in the business for 20 plus years, and they're typically used to working from home. But there's Fifteen or 16,000 employees at LinkedIn, and then obviously vastly more at Microsoft, who is our parent company. And many of them are used to the office culture. They're used to not being in isolation. They're used to being able to look next door to their desk and ask a peer a question. They're used to being out in the field and being on site with customers. So there's a, a feeling of isolation. So we've erred on the side of over communicating with them because we've been concerned about their well being. But I think that we've we become mindful of survey fatigue and we've started to make them, even though they're very frequent, very short and very pointed, right? So three, five questions to get to the heart of the matter on whatever it is we're looking for. For instance, it was work from home at one point. How are you feeling? Do you have the things that you need to, to meet your needs? Um, what are you struggling with? And we were able to use those answers to make good decisions pretty quickly, but we're not trying to hit them with multiple topics at once. I think we've we've taken frequency maybe a little bit too far, but I think we've been on point with with the volume of questions in the survey. So to manage fatigue, I'd give us probably a B plus. So staying in, in that employee survey field, um, we have a follow up question um, about employee surveys being early and often. Are you seeing employees more or less willing to participate and provide more actionable feedback in these remote times? More so for us, because I think there's a safety in being able to provide the anonymized feedback in you're also getting less at bats to be able to provide it because the hallway conversations are gone. You don't see your manager physically every day. Um, so I think that we actually have, have achieved more feedback from our 
our field than we may have in in the in the prior environment where everybody was in an office together. All right. Uh, from Delvin Diaz, what are the, what are the future norms looking like for our learners now that we have become more comfortable with virtual delivery, less of classroom versus delivery or versus, sorry, less of classroom delivery versus virtual? What's the new norm? I don't know the answer, but I can provide an opinion. So my opinion and, and what I'm seeing is that there will always be a place for instructor-led training on site and in person when we go back to whatever normal is. But what we're seeing is that there is so many initiatives that can be accomplished by way of remote learning and being able to use the virtual space to drive a large volume of our initiatives. An example that, that I can provide from our own team is that we've, we've delivered so much of our learning virtually. This year, a big initiative for us is for all of our leadership teams to go through inclusive leadership training, compassionate leadership training, understanding how to conduct and facilitate uh, town halls so that we can really, be, you know, we can hear back from our customers. So listening is another big skill that we're developing within our organization, all of which can really be devoured from the comfort of our home. But when we go through, through something like a wholesale uh, sales methodology change, we had taken on a, a, a third party consultant to help us with our methodology to better understand customer needs and then diagnose what we might be able to do strategically for that customer. I think that's something that we took on an instructor led training because of the level of intensity, the need for interaction and the role playing that needed to take place. So there will always be a place for that. So I think the new normal will still include those things, but I think they'll be reserved for bigger bets in the organization where the ROI is incredibly large and the stakes for success or failure are incredibly important. Okay. And, you know, just from a learning perspective, you do see um, now that more and more people are, are migrating towards um, that online virtual training rather than that instructor led. First of all, because it's more cost effective, the virtual standpoint, uh, bringing people into a classroom, you know, you have to have trainers and the facilities and all of that. Uh, the virtual is, is definitely a more cost effective approach. Um, next question. What are the best practices, excuse me, what are the best practices that can be used to get the attention of executives for l &D issues since they're for focusing on quick pivoting strategies. Can you, can you just repeat the first part of that question? It went out a little bit. Sure. What are best practices that can be used to get the attention of executives for L&D issues since they are focusing on quick pivoting strategies? So I believe that starting the discussion in their wheelhouse with return on investment is always the most important thing. So being really, really anchored in the why. Good example. We've gone through this uh, now multiple months. We actually took it on right before COVID happened was our sales methodology training. And it's massive in scale, right? It's global. North America did it first and EMEA was second. And when you think about that kind of change, you know, on the question of commitment, you're either in or you're out. Life doesn't exist in between because we've now got to speak a common language and we've got to be able to do it with fluency across any number of different parts of the organization. Probably the most important pillar of that program being successful was that our executive C-level leaders were sitting in the room with us during those trainings, not leading them. They were learners in those rooms. They were role-playing with the individuals in the room and messing up. <laughs> like how important is that? You have to have a culture where it's okay to be vulnerable you have to have a culture where learning is not expected to be self-serving where it's myself or another peer of mine gets in front of a room to tell you all the things that we know, who cares, right? Like they need to see us actually mess up and experience the process of learning in order to get people really gravitated towards those programs. I think they tend to succeed the best because people feel that it's authentic, it's real. So how do you make the executives become vulnerable or open to those types of things? Well, when outlining what we expect, 
there's the role playing aspect of it. And, you know, there, there's really no way to, to escape that you're going to mess up when you're learning something new. Mm -hmm. uh, for us, the, the change was pretty immense in terms of how we were engaging customers stylistically to how we've uh, intended now to move towards engaging customers. And so with, with those executives not being uh, experts in it, the expectation up front was that that was what we needed from them, right? And they are willing to play ball because of the payoff. So the payoff for us, just getting really tactical, is across the sales organization, it's accelerated sales cycles. It's larger annual contract values. There's a payoff that is very meaningful to them, but you've got to speak their language. You can't get a line of business leader committed to something that doesn't benefit their top priorities. So going back to the old um, L&D terminology, what's in it for them? Yes. We got to do that with them piece. Awesome. All right, we're going to take one last question because we are we have about four minutes left. So I've seen L&D development become more agile, more aligned with continuous development. What I have yet to see is a delivery strategy for pushing out learning products in a continuous agile fashion. Have you seen any potential solutions for this problem? Trying to think of specific examples, none are coming to mind, um, but I will say that the best, the best organizations at engaging their learners in an agile fashion tend to take on controllable populations first. Remember, my team supports the largest of our customer base. So think of organizations with 100,000 employees, 500,000 employees, so on and so forth. They're not trying to boil the ocean. They're taking on potentially in order of prioritization and importance, the parts of the organization that will benefit best, most, and who will adapt to it quickest so that it can become contagious throughout the organization. Got it. All right, I'm gonna squeeze in one more. I have one last question. Um, hey, hello, Anthony. In addition to asking teammates Hi. how they're doing, what are some activities or exercises that have been that are being leveraged to help individuals overcome the stress of our current environment? That's a great question. It is. Two that I really love. I mean, I can only speak from personal experience, but two that I really love. Uh, one, if anyone has a team of folks, maybe it's you know under 15 people or you've got the time to carve out, Going beyond the employee and getting three-dimensional with the individual has been the biggest way for me to dig deep with my team. And an exercise that I love is Strengths Finder. So Strengths-Based Leadership is a book that is pretty old at this point, but there's an assessment within it that helps an, an individual understand their top five strengths. The concept behind Strengths Finder is that we are all programmed to understand what we don't do well and work on our weaknesses, but we very rarely leverage our strengths. And it gives the adage of the child that comes home with a report card that's got five A's on it and one B. And the, the minute we see that, we go right to, hey, what happened with the B? Mm -hmm. What happened there? My team doing Strengths Finder allowed us to get three-dimensional in the individual. It allowed the space for everybody to articulate who they were, what they were feeling, and what made them tick. And we did it not because people want to sit there and talk about themselves. We did it because understanding builds connectivity builds community, builds culture. That's all we cared about. And I've done that continuously with my teams through the years, but this year I would say has been the most important session that we've ever had because it was needed. People needed to feel heard and understood. Agreed, agreed. This is um, unsettling and precedented times that we've never experienced before. And how to navigate through this um, not only internally, but with working with our coworkers and our peers is, is challenging. So, so thank you. Anthony, um, thank you very much for your time today. We appreciate the insight that you've been able to provide with us, just giving us an overview of what's happening from a learning perspective, what's needed, what's necessary, and then just a little insight into the future. We appreciate the time that you spent with us 
And we want to continue this conversation. So we need to figure out how to bring you in and keep this conversation going on beyond Expo. So look for us to kind of figure out how to do that. So everyone else, thank you for joining us. And uh, we have a panel coming up in about 15 minutes to actually take what Anthony has said and apply it down to a business level, talking to individual L&D leaders within the business and applying what he has just talked about. So Anthony, thank you very much. And everyone else, thank you for attending this session. Have a great, great rest of your day. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you.